Okay. Guys, this is The Love and Show, and this week we are joined by Nathan Eccleston. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? Doing well, thank you. How are you doing? I'm very well. I believe you're co-founder of Peaches Sports. First of all, what's your setup at the moment? Where are we talking to you from? I'm in Dubai at the minute. Um, I'm staying. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say where I'm staying, but I'm staying in Dubai at the minute on the palm. And um, so far, it's, it's, it's been nice. I mean, there's worse places to be, I imagine. Um, <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about you. I know you have a background in football, but first I want to talk about the fact that you're co-founder of Peaches Sports. What side of, what does, if you're co-founder, what side of the business are you on and what exactly do you do? Well, I actually founded the company by myself um, and I oversee everything um, regarding the business from the design um, to the finance. Um, we have three, three staff members um, that oversee other elements. So let's say the, um, the marketing aspect from media marketing, we have people in the warehouse. Um, but in terms of the actual company, yeah, I, I, I oversee absolutely everything. I'm a bit of a control freak when it comes to stuff like that. I feel like that's always the case, especially for startups. You kind of become a jack of all trades and master of them all too. <laughs> but, um, but you started in football. Was your passion always going to be business or was it sports? Or how do you kind of, where does your passion lie? Well, initially when I was younger, I was always passionate about football. Um, that was like my love of my life, so to speak. Um, and being from England, everybody in the UK always played football on the streets. And um, I got into football at a very young age and then um, made my way up through the ranks at Berry FC initially and then signed to Liverpool as a junior at 15. And then I went on to, to be there for six years and then I had a professional career up until three years ago. So I think when I was, when I was initially playing football, especially the older I got, around 19, 20, I understood like, the business element and business side to football after signing a couple of professional contracts and then... I started to understand media and advertisements and um, that type of thing. And I was just always curious. And I've always been into fashion. And it was actually because I, I, I went to LA on holiday and I, I seen the amount of women there that was working out. It was literally like a lifestyle. And um, I was like, oh, that's like a, a good concept. And um, I thought maybe I'll, I'll try, my, try my luck in that. Well, we'll definitely talk about fitness as a lifestyle and branding in a second. But... Uh, what happened in when you left Liverpool? What made you decide to leave, or how did you bow out? Um, so when I was at Liverpool, I think I was 21 years of age when I finally left, and I could have went on loan for a, a, a one more season um, to Sheffield United, and I think at the time they was in League One, and then I had the opportunity to go to Blackpool under Ian Holloway, or I could have continued to stay at Liverpool for the remainder of the season, but. At that point in my career, I just wanted to be playing regular first team football. And um, I was given an opportunity by Brendan Rodgers, uh, sorry, yeah, Brendan Rodgers to leave Liverpool and then go sign for Blackpool under Ian Holloway. And um, I signed for Blackpool and within the first 10 weeks, we was top of the league. And as a striker, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't get a look in because the strikers at the time were scoring goals. And then in the 10th week, I got injured. And coincidentally, during that time, Liverpool's top three strikers all got injured and they was having to play youth team players like on the bench, a couple of the reserve team players that were starting. And at that point, it kind of made me realise that, oh, if I maybe still would have been at Liverpool, I would have got even more of an opportunity. Um, but everything happened to a reason. And then I was at Blackpool for two seasons. I kept on having re reoccurring hamstring injuries. And then, um, so I didn't really get that much game time. And then I went to um, went to play in Scotland for a season. Um, again, I was at Partick Thistle for six months, and then I went to um, Kilmarnock for the other six months. And I think during that time, I was playing inconsistently. And um, as a as a striker, it's all based on confidence. If your confidence is sky high, you're going to be playing well. If it's not, then um, the game the games are not going to be the same. So then my last team that I played for was actually in Hungary, a team called Becky Scarborough in the Hungarian first division. 
And that was a great experience, man. It was something that I've always wanted to do, travel and play abroad. Um, and the lifestyle was very different, very humbling for me. It just made me appreciate a lot of things. Um, but at that point, when I was at Scotland, I had already started Peaches. And then Peaches had been a year old. And then I realized that if I really dedicate myself to business, um, that there's a lot more longevity in it. And then I kind of had to make a logical decision rather than an emotional decision against everybody. Uh, my mom, my dad, everybody was like, no, you could still play. Because I was only 25 at the time and there was still a lot of opportunity for progress. But at the time, I think I just got to the stage where I, I lost a little bit of love for the game and I, I just stopped it to, to stop playing. Wow, well, I definitely want to talk about your decision to move on and how you managed it in a second. But do you have kind of a career highlight in football before you move on to business? Um, that you can remember to talk about, uh, I don't know if it's something small or a defining moment that you thought, you thought like, this is it, I'm in the game. Wow. Um, I, probably have, I probably have two, to be honest. Um, the first one was my very first time at Liverpool. Um, I remember, actually, probably coexist so the initial time when it was at Berry, I went on trial at Man United what not a lot of many people know I went on a six week trial and I uh, played there for like um, six weeks scored like five goals I thought I was going to get signed and due to the compensation package um, the deal never materialised so a year later I got a phone call um, from my coach at Berry to say Liverpool was interested in me so then I met up with one of the scouts from Liverpool who's I think his mom lived in the same area as me. We met up in a McDonald's. Um, he said, like, they want, want you to come down and, and play at Anfield because what Liverpool did to all of the junior players at the end of the year, he would let all of the junior players play on Anfield as, like, an experience. So I remember going there and we played, like, small five-a-side matches. And I'm, I think I scored, like, 11 goals. It was something ridiculous. Um, and then I remember Steve Highway calling... Uh, the scout to tell him that he was interested and he wanted to sign me. And I just remember crying in my mom's living room that that Liverpool Football Club wanted to sign me. And obviously being a Manchester lad, they're known as our rivals, but they're such a big club, yeah. such an overwhelming fe feeling. So that was definitely one of my first real experiences of like really loving the game and being grateful for the opportunity. And then the second experience was possibly after my debut, but it was, we played a cup game against Northampton and um, I came on as a substitute and had like a, a good impact. And then we managed to go through to um, penalties. And during the penalties, I took the third penalty and I remember stepping up really confident and took my shot and it hit the crossbar. The keeper went the wrong way and it hit the crossbar. And I remember at the time, I was thinking, if that was just a little bit lower and it went in and it was at the cup end, how it would have changed my life. We ended up getting knocked out of the cup game against Northampton, which again was pretty bad press for the football club. But I remember being in the change room after and I was, I was crying because I was 19. I'd missed the penalty at the cup end. I was really upset. And I remember Sammy Lee, the assistant coach, coming up to me just saying, listen, you're going to be OK. Like, even the top players have missed penalties and like, this is just going to be the start of your career. And um, you have these kind of setbacks in life. And I just remember afterwards just going to my apartment and just being really upset. And then the next day in training, like, um, Stevie, Stephen Gerrard came up to me and was just, was just like, listen, you're going to be OK. Like, I've missed penalties. Like, we all miss opportunities. Um, you're going to be okay. And I think from that moment, I didn't really take everything to heart when it came to football because uh, it really got to me at the time. Um, but they was the two like conflicting moments in football that really uh, shaped my outlook on life. For sure. Hi, hello. But you mentioned a couple of things there about when you were 21, you started noticing the business side and also making the decision kind of head versus heart to leave football. Um, and I think so many sports players maybe don't look at the business side when they're going through it. And, you know, it's amazing that you did and you took the decision. What grabbed you about Peaches Sports or why? Do you want to explain a little bit about what it is and why you think it works? 
Yeah, so Peachy Sports is a athleisure brand specifically for women. Um, and we provide a variety of products from sports bras to leggings to hoodies uh, to jackets. Um, in the past, we've done water bottles, gym bags. We've even done swimwear, um, which got a lot of success too. And one of my friends, excuse me, his business partner is also the founder of Gymshark, which is a very big company worldwide. And incidentally, we all came on holiday to Dubai. And um, that's when me and him um, was having conversations about Gymshark and the progression of Gymshark. And um, we was, prior to that, my friend, Oh yeah, sorry. So when we was on the holiday, we were speaking about Gymshark and he was like a year younger than me. And he was telling me about Gymshark's growth, um, how well they're doing like in terms of revenue, um, the impact that they're having on the fitness industry. Um, and again, I was 20 years of age and from my, from my age group, I was, I, was, I was earning considerably well. And he was telling me about the the benefits of the tax so as a, as a business owner you only pay 20 percent in tax at the time i was getting paid 50 um i was having to pay 50 percent in tax he was able to recoup a lot of his business expenses for his business and um the, a lot of the perks that came with it in terms of the financial side so that's initially what interested me in business in general and then i started to look at football and that well if they can afford to pay the the highest and the player let's say steven gerald or fernando torres like six figures weekly, then the owners must be getting paid a lot of money. And then I realized that the revenue was coming from media, media rights and um, advertisement. And I was like, oh, okay. And then I understood like shirt sales, uh, the, the club shop, merchandise. So then I, would, I, I, came, I became really curious about business in general. Um, and maybe that distraction also made me realize that oh there's other ways to to succeed so then when, when we had a conversation in dubai about sportswear etc I, I did a bit of my market research and at the time there wasn't that many sportswear brands specifically for women so then also that summer i went to la and then it just magnified it was almost like yeah this is what you need to do um because every single woman in, in la that i come across was in gym leggings they all went to the gym and they all ate relatively healthy and um, my sister well two of my sisters um, in the past they've always had issues with like working out they've always been up and down with their, their weight but more than fitness our slogan is love health happiness you know and regardless of how big you are how small you are mentally is how you are inside and being happy so i wanted to cross over like the fashion element but also the mental element that comes with with fitness because not many people understand that being an athlete myself um, it's okay to be physically fit but you've also got to be mentally fit as well to get the best out of your performance so i really want to cross over 100 percent. it's interesting um like fitness wear is not just for fitness it's for all shapes and sizes at any time of the day. I'm definitely wearing leggings right now, you can't see. But um, my thing is, how do you stand out? Because there's so many, like you said, it wasn't when you started, but there's so many fitness and lifestyle brands. Like I've seen your Instagram account and you do have hundred K followers, which is huge. How do you build that? And how do you stand out among all of the other fitness brands right now? I personally believe it's because I don't come from that world. I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't go to university. I didn't study fashion. Um, and I think at the time that like, social media was about three or four years old. So I got into it like early, um, but also late at the same time. And I've just always wanted to be different because I have a different mindset. I don't really like to go what I guess society deems as acceptable. Um, and even in the past, it's been a little bit torn in between what my heart says and what my head says because... Um, even down to our designs and our, and, and our social media. I'm very conscious about our image and how we're portrayed to young women and because we have a particular young audience um, mm -hmm. aware of like social media and the type of models that we use um, 
And I think initially what happened was to differentiate myself. Everybody was targeting fitness models. This is the girls that go to the gym, let's say four or five times a week, have a really strict diet, um, really live the, the fitness lifestyle. And I just knew that you don't need to go to the gym five days a week or you don't need to be strict with your diet. Even if you work out for 20 minutes a day, that 20 minutes is much better than not doing anything that day. And I think by releasing those um, endorphins daily, uh, puts you in a better mood. So I started targeting uh, the influencers that initially was wearing, um, I'd, I'd say more formal wear, like nightlife stuff, um, fashionable stuff, because I knew that their audience um, particularly was male, uh, female dominant and they followed them for their style not necessarily for their fitness routine. Mm. And then in the beginning, that was, that was a, a success. And, and still to this day, that's kind of our blueprint. I kind of, there's a book called Blue Ocean Strategy for anybody that likes to read books. And um, I really recommend that book because it talks about people following the red ocean. So everybody wants to emulate Gymshark, but there's only ever going to be one Gymshark. So I, I'd like to be in my own lane and, and be Peach's sports and be that little bit different because our, our products are different to the typical gym, um, gym wear like brand or ethos, so to speak. But yeah, that's initially how we started. We started targeting influencers that wasn't necessarily in the fitness sector and the, the girls that go to the gym, but they don't go to the gym like um, that free so they can wear the gym clothing to the gym or outside of the gym and that's because so now I think influencer marketing on Instagram is huge but as social media changes as the landscape changes people switch to TikTok do you switch with them or do you follow these trends or how do you work to be honest no I don't I, I, I try to stay away from trends um, because trends here today and gone tomorrow you, you can have a relatively successful time following trends, um, but to have a sustainable brand and have longevity, you need to have the core customer base that really buy into the brand and what the brand stands for. And um, you, can, you can drive revenue by some of these, um, these apps. But for me, I don't really follow the trends. Um, we look at it for research basis is um but we don't often go because it's like youtube youtube's a massive driver for revenue um also there's um i'm trying to think of the other name that's very big nah. very i'm gonna yeah i have the app it's where people go for inspiration Pinterest? For some, Pinterest, yeah. I, for some reason, the, the name was uh, eluding me there for a second. But so I'm more the type of Pinterest where everybody's going to look to go to YouTube, but the cost or the acquisi acquisition cost might be a little bit higher. Um, but on Pinterest, if you promote on Pinterest, then it's generally people searching for a particular item or getting inspiration from somewhere. And people don't really target that audience and that's like 95 percent or 90 percent female based so i don't really like to cross over because i feel like when you cross over audiences you don't specifically target your audience it might drive um traffic but it's driving the wrong type of traffic so i specifically just focus on my core audience and, and what they like and where they are if they're in tiktok then cool we'll go to tiktok but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be trend that it would just be data driven purely. What piece of advice do you live by every day or try to live by? Or what piece of advice have you read that resonates with you and you think that's how I need to be living my life? Wow. Um, well I read a lot of books. So I think every single time I read a book I, I learn something new. But I posted something on my Instagram yesterday about a book called Fear. Um, and by the end of this interview, I'll find you the author because it's a little bit difficult to pronounce. He's a Vietnamese monk. Mm -hmm. And I read that book about eight months ago. And um, in, in, 
says it in the title about fear. And um, I really realized that we all live with fear from a young age. We're kind of conditioned to have these like um, reservations regarding things that we pursue and the, the thought of failure or actually even achieving our dreams sometimes can be scary. Um, and once I read that book, even more so with business and my lifestyle, like everything changed. Like I said, I have nothing to be fearful of and I'm great. Like gratitude is massive for me. So no matter what, as long as I wake up in the morning and I'm, and I'm healthy, I will always remain grateful. So that's something I live by daily, like just forever being grateful. And if I can eliminate as much fear as possible, the better. Amazing. And I wasn't actually going to ask this, but I feel like because your background is crossing over two huge industries, um, if you could have three people for dinner, dead or alive, with you right now in your <laughs> isolation, who would you bring? Dead or alive? Um, uh, Muhammad Ali would be one of them, for sure. Um, Jay-Z, for sure. And I would love to, I'd probably love to have a conversation. Probably have a conversation with Elon Musk. He's a, he's like a genius, but and then sometimes he, he does things that I'm like, wow, he, that's like a bit crazy, but he's a genius and I would love to have a conversation with him. So yeah, that would be my three, Muhammad Ali, uh, Jay-Z and uh, Elon Musk. They would that's definitely a very cool dinner table you've chosen. <laughs> Uh, I said it's a very cool dinner table you've chosen. Before we go, I would love to know very briefly, what does the next five years look like for you? Do you make five-year plans? Do you make five, ten-year plans? Or do you live day by day? Yeah, um, I try to appreciate each day. So that for sure. But I do have a plan. I think by 2023, I want to be regarded as the biggest sportswear company in the UK. Maybe my goal should be bigger and want to be worldwide, but I want to conquer the UK first, um, like in that sector specifically for sportswear for women, age range 16 to 35. Like I want to be the biggest sportswear company um, in the country. And five years from now, um, continually growing, continually learning and being happy. <laughs> Five years from now, I want to continue to be happy. So, um, yeah, that, that's probably my five-year five year goal plan. There's no bad plan. I feel like mine is just to be happy, and if everything else falls into place, it's good. Um, thank you so much for, like, a little bit of background about you. Uh, we really appreciate it. You're welcome any time when this lifts. Hopefully, we'll have you in the studio. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Appreciate it being Not at all. Guys, that is The Love and Show. We are back next week same time same place have a good one and stay safe see you soon